Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the When the Squirrels Stole My Sister book launch, virtual book launch. Uh, uh, by maybe a middle of next year, we can actually do these in person. Uh, but uh, it, it's, it's exciting to get everybody here now. I'd like to thank Perfect Books in Ottawa and the book lore in Orangeville for being to be, uh, bookstores um, who will um, be able to see. If you want to buy the book, they'll help you buy the book. They'll, they can send it to you, or if you're local, you can get stop in and buy it from them. Please support your local bookstores. They do work hard uh, at supporting all of our authors. Uh, so we're going to have both Catherine and Sean speaking. Uh, we'll start with uh, Catherine first. Uh, Catherine, do you want to start out? Um, sure. Yes. Thank you all. Well, thank you, Holly and Fitzhenry and Whiteside for hosting this. And uh, mostly thank you guys for it's coming to keep us company. I'm thrilled to launch this picture book. Uh, it's my second picture book. I have a few novels and several short stories, but picture books are really special if you're a writer because you hand in a couple of pages that look like this and then you get back a work of art. It's a magical thing. So I'm really thrilled to have a new picture book. And this picture book in particular is important to me because it's part of a thread that runs through my whole life. Um, when I was a kid, being stolen away by squirrels would have been my dream. I love squirrels. And so this uh, story was inspired by a couple of real life squirrels. About 10 years ago here in the yard I'm in, I made friends <laughs> with a squirrel whom I called little mama because she had so many babies year after year. And she would sit on my deck and wait patiently for her nut. I know you're not supposed to feed wildlife, but I did. And, um, and she reminded me of when I was a child, I tamed a squirrel whom I named Charlie and I tamed him to eat right out of my hand. And I remember vividly him eating out of one hand while I pet his little head with the other hand and he was trembling. And I know now that the poor thing was terrified, <laughs> but at the time I just thought, oh, he loves me so much. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote this book in part to gently mock, not my love of wild animals, but my notion, my conviction that they really love me back, which I'm sure I still feel deep down. And so uh, in this book, that, that girl, that animal loving girl is gently mocked by her little sister. And that part, I'm gonna say it's not true. I have no little sisters. And while it is true, I have two big sisters and they are both sweet animal loving people. And it is true, I shared a bedroom with my big sister. And if squirrels had taken her away, I would have had the bedroom all to myself. But that doesn't mean I wanted her to disappear into the tree. So I am not the snarky little narrator who wants her squirrel, her uh, sister to disappear. I'm more the girl in the tree. And uh, you can tell even now that I love squirrels by uh, my website. I have a page for this book and it has a lot of extras. It has a, a squirrel A to Z and follow-up activities. I've got a maze and a cootie catcher and a memory game. And I've got videos of squirrels doing taste tests and spoiler alert, they eat everything. And I also have uh, an interview with a wildlife rehabilitator who, fo who fosters orphan squirrels who I met this summer. And I have one thing that I'm gonna share with you tonight and that's some um, children's squirrel art. That's like this. I have a little slideshow to share with you. On my website, I have a, a longer show, but I'm gonna share about one minute. Um, in last May and June, I went to Greater Gatineau Elementary School for about 10 days of virtual school visits. And this book was not ready, but I did have a couple of pictures from Sean and I had the story that I shared along with my older picture book. And so when this book came out this fall, the kindergarten teachers there and one of the grade two teachers got their students to make squirrel art mm -hmm. um, to help me decorate the virtual walls of this mm -hmm. launch. You can see some here. Mm -hmm. And so I encourage you to go to my website to see the whole show. But right now I'm going to play you the short slideshow and it's my segue into passing the mic to the artist, Sean. And it was actually Holly's idea to do that clever segue. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully this will work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Did you hear music too? Yeah. Yes. It was great. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Okay, that worked. Now, Sean, it's all yours. I uh, are you are you going to read the story tonight? Would you rather I read it now? Uh, no, up to you. I was going to read the story. Okay. I thought. I'll... So I'll talk about the art a little bit. Yes. Okay. Unless you want me to read the story <laughs> first. It's up... No, it's fine. Um, I'll pretty well for every picture book, it the thing that comes first is the story. So an author creates a great story, um, gives it to the publisher, and the publisher says that yeah, it's really wonderful. Now I want you to edit some more, and the author says no, no. Anyway, mm -hmm. and then the author finds or the publisher finds uh, an illustrator whose style would best suit the story. So Holly. Uh, and others at Fitzhenry and Whiteside called me up and said, here's this story, do you like it? And would you like to do it? And I said, yes, yes. Mm. So um, we take Holly's words, or Holly, the Catherine's words, mm -hmm. um, and um, Catherine wrote this story really well because she didn't write too much. She didn't describe every little detail. Uh, she, she would just say a few words like, um, the, uh, the squirrels thought about using a parachute uh, and then left the mm -hmm. rest of the day to create like the great converse. All that scene. Yeah. So I'm going to show you quickly how a, a scene comes together. And this is <clears throat> uh, toward the end of the book. Uh, the squirrels are parachuting out of mm -hmm. uh, a tree. And so I can, can you see that? Is it in focus or is it a mess? Move it back a little bit. Too far. Anyway, we start with a couple of little drawings of squirrels uh, jumping, using buckets for parachutes, any sort of thing that will work. Um, and then I keep doing more. And if, if you write a story, you don't just write it and it's done. You write it and then you edit and edit and edit. And Creating the pictures is exactly the same process. You create, you know, for the, the 25 pictures in a book, you probably uh, work on 150 to 200 different little drawings to create those. So here are two more. Is that in focus or am I wasting my time? You see it? All right. Next, I'll show you one more. Um, another squirrel. Uh, using uh, uh, one of the, uh, what do they call the sacks that the peanuts come in, uh, using that for a parachute. And go to this sketchbook. I have a whole bunch of sketchbooks and I work on more squirrels jumping. And here's a parachute uh, just in uh, watercolor that I thought would, would work and I'm using sort of complementary colors. Once I have all these little drawings and I put them all together, um, I throw them into the computer and I create a, a big line drawing. And the line drawings uh, look like this. Now I threw the line drawing out that I used for the parachute, but this is a two, two page spread. So two pages in the book would look like this. Uh, then I take this, I trace it onto some really high quality uh, watercolor paper, and then I start painting. And the final art comes out like this. Mm -hmm. that sort of clear. So that's the, uh, that's the process at any rate. Um, it takes quite a while. <laughs> Uh, to do each one of these paintings, I'll show you one more. Um, to do all of these paintings, the painting part takes about 40 hours. 
Um, and then the all the drawings and the research and everything else take, I don't know how much, uh, another ton of time. So it takes, normally it takes me about nine months to illustrate a book. Uh, this one went much longer, uh, partly because of COVID. <laughs> I couldn't get the uh, the model that I wanted for the uh, the girl, uh, and when all of and so I did create a model which uh, the people at Fitzhenry and Whiteside told me they hated. <laughs> I agree with them; it wasn't that good. So I found another model who happens to be uh, my niece and my great niece. So my niece is an excellent photographer, and her daughter was just the right age. So she ended up being uh, the model for this this final book. Mm -hmm. That's back to you, Catherine. Yeah, sure, yes. And now I can uh, read to you the book mm -hmm. and uh, then you'll see Sean's final art. So, When the Squirrel Stole My Sister, story by Catherine Austin, illustrations by Sean Cassidy. Published by Fitzhenry and Whiteside. It's like backing up a car. I can't uh, <laughs> figure out how to hold it straight. All right. And there's a beautiful squirrel-filled yard. Mm. Well. Uh, My sister people. tamed a squirrel with peanuts until it ate out of her hand. She called the squirrel little mama because it had such a big belly, always full of babies or milk. Each morning, little mama would hop onto our deck to beg for food, and my sister would laugh and dance to see her. They had such a loving relationship. My sister loved little mama, and little mama loved my sister's peanuts. <clears throat> little mama grew tired of hunching over in wind and rain, trying to look adorable while waiting for a few nuts. Life would be easier if she stored the nuts in her nest. So she decided to steal them. Unfortunately, no one told little mama that bags of peanuts were available without my sister attached to them. So she stole my sister. No use crying over spilled pistachios, I always say. We should have known the squirrels were trying something tricky, planning something tricky because little mama built the largest nest ever seen on our street and quite possibly on our planet. She had Suspiciously, sorry, no, nope. she invited an awful lot of friends and family to the yard. And she had suspiciously long conversations with blue jays. Little mama led the nut nabbing last week when my sister stepped outside with a brand new burlap bag of unsalted dry roasted peanuts in the shell. I couldn't blame the squirrels. It is fall after all, and they have to stock up. All of little mama's kits and grandkits and great grandkits helped out. Good thing my sister likes surprises. The blue jays waited in the apple tree, ready to do their part for peanuts. Little mama sat alone on the deck, looking sweet and innocent. Then my sister shook the bag of peanuts and shouted, come and get it. At first, my sister laughed and danced because she couldn't believe how much the squirrels loved her. Her laughter grew a bit hysterical when they lifted her off the ground. They hauled her up the oak tree in no time at all. My sister did not seem too upset. Besides, no use crying over spilled cashews, I always say. I worry that the bag of peanuts will soon be empty and little mama will discover that nuts don't actually come from my sister. She might toss my sister out of the nest, mistaking her dress for a parachute. I want my sister to be happy. So I'm sending up a bag of deluxe mixed nuts, hazelnuts, macadamias, almonds, and walnuts. With these, my sister can persuade little mama to let her stay forever. I will be lonely, of course, since I will never get to share a bedroom with my sweet sister again. But no use crying over spilled pecans, I always say. 
And that's the end. And I am I love my sisters. <laughs> <laughs> Great story and great illustration. Yeah. Love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, the, the comments are uh, so cute, fun refrain, awesome. Um, oh, what a that's nice. story. That's wonderful, Catherine and Sean. Such a richness of colors and expression to the artwork. So, yeah, uh, very popular. Kids' um, art is so cool. Kid nice. art is the best. Um, yes, so, the kids. The kids at Greater Gatineau, when they did read the book this fall, they said, we did a great job. <laughs> so thank you, kindergartners. <laughs> kids are great judges. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, this is really weird for Catherine and me. <laughs> um, like you said before, because we're used to doing it live and in front of a, a live audience, we can, I guess you react to them, you know what's going on. Um, anyway, so can I do a little bit of drawing now? Is that appropriate? And then after that, we'll have questions and comments or anything. Or yeah. have I jumped ahead of you? I'm no, ready to draw. All right. Is that okay with you, Kathy? Oh. oh, yeah, for sure. I encourage yeah. everyone to pick up a pencil yeah. and do the drawing lesson. We'll all draw squirrels. Mm. Pencil and paper. We're going to draw three squirrels. Uh, and just a squirrel's head. And if you cannot draw anything, you can draw this, I promise. Um, usually when, when I'm doing it, uh, the children and the women are all quite eager and they all you know, pick up pencils and paper and they all jump in. I find if anyone holds back, it's usually the men for some reason. <laughs> so if you're a guy, pick up a pencil, man up, we're going to draw three of them. I'll draw one on here and hopefully you can follow. And I'll draw it three times with small little changes and show you what you can do. So for the squirrel, uh, and I'm drawing big here, it doesn't matter how big or small you do it, but I will fill most of this space with one squirrel face. For his nose, I'm using just an, an ellipse, so an egg shape like that. So draw, draw a little egg in the middle. And let me know if I'm going too fast. For the eyes, what you do is you place your pencil right in the middle of the top of the nose. You draw a line straight up and then sideways and back down to the nose. And then for the other eye, we do the same. We start at the nose, go straight up, sideways back down to the nose looks like a little bunny and i'm drawing a, a happy face uh, when you're happy when you see something you like the pupils in your eyes the black circles in the middle get big so i'm going to draw two big pupils so two lines across the bottom and then just fill them in and the colored part of your eye, it doesn't matter if it's big or small. So I'm not even gonna bother with that now. And let me do it. I'm drawing sideways and usually what happens is everything comes out on a slant. So um, part of the weirdness of this. All the pets I've had, in fact, most animals, furry animals have a little part under their nose where the fur is divided. So I like to draw a little line underneath the nose, showing where that fur goes. And then we'll draw a smile, half of the smile on this side and half of the smile on the other side. And lots of people like to put a little curved line at the end of the smile, makes it even smilier. And squirrels have the same teeth as rabbits and mice and rats and everything else. So I'm going to draw two big teeth. One down here and one beside it. They can be touching, 
they can be far apart, doesn't really matter. And now for the fur. The fur is a, a little bit tricky. I'm going to use a, a zigzag line like this, just very rough. So I'm going to start up here near the top of one eye, right beside the eye. And I'll do little zigzag lines, just really rough scribbly lines, go down around the nose and bump into the teeth. Squirrels have fat cheeks. They're stuffing all sorts of food in there that they can then transport and hide. Then we do the same the other side. Start near the eye and just a really squiggly yeah, line. Doesn't have to be perfect. In fact, usually if it's not perfect, it's better. All those little mistakes you make, they, they end up being something new. We do a little ear, so a little part of a circle on one side, part of a circle on the other. And so a little bit of fur in between the ears. So there's squirrel number one, happy squirrel. Nice smile, big pupils. Okay. And I'll get a new sheet of paper. Uh, For the second squirrel face, we're going to do almost the same thing, but we'll make a few little changes and those little changes will make a very different face. So I'm going to start the same way. Nose in the middle, big ellipse or egg shape or an oval. And we'll draw the eyes the same way, but don't put in the pupils. So, Start in the middle of the nose, go straight in the air, around and back down, and then back to the middle, you can use the same middle line, back down. And every time we move our pupils around, every time we look in a different direction, we actually get a different expression. So for this one, I'm going to make this squirrel look up. So I put a little curved line at the top of one eye, little curve at the top of the other, and then just fill them in. Don't worry about eyebrows and eyelashes and all that, doesn't matter. And uh, underneath the nose, that little line that comes straight down. And we'll do the same kind of mouth. Uh, half a smile on one side, half a smile on the other. And two teeth. I'm going to make the teeth touch each other this time. And the same kind of fur. So start near the top of one eye, do a shaky, squiggly, zigzaggy line going around the mouth and bumping into the tooth. And then the same on the other side. Oops, this is really shaky. And a couple of ears. And some hair on top of his head, or fur on top of his head. So now we have a squirrel who's thinking good things. You say, what's your favorite dessert? You go, mmm. So you smile and you look up. And yes. Catherine gets a pass. <laughs> okay, one more. And then I'll tell you what you can do on your own with things like with these faces. Am I going too fast? No? All right. <coughs> All right. So we'll start the same way with the same nose. And this time we're going to make the eyes a little bit different. We're going to um, make the tops of the eyes first. So above these eyes, I'm going to draw a little funnel, a little funnel shape, you know, so it will look like here's the nose 
of the funnel will look like that. So if I go above the nose, not too close to it, and I draw a line sloping up in one direction, leave a little space and draw a line sloping up in the other direction. And I think you know what kind of face this is going to be. Uh, with eyes like that, it, he's going to look mad or angry. Some people like to take, if you want to make him look really angry, make those little uh, tops of the eyes into little check marks. And that sort of makes, creates a frown in the middle. And then we put in the rest of the eye. So don't put in the pupil yet. We put in the one side of the eye going down to the nose and the other side going down to the nose. And then for the other eye, the same thing, the line on the inside of the eye and the line on the outside of the eye. And if somebody is angry, their pupils get really small. We talk about people, mean people having beady little eyes. And that's because the, it's actually the color part of the eye expands and the pupil gets tiny. There are lots of other reasons for it to do that as well. Anyway, and if you're really angry at someone, where do you look? Usually straight ahead at that person. So I'm going to do two tiny little pupils looking straight ahead. Now, I'm going to make one more change. Ooh, we're going to have to put the mouth. So a little line under the nose. And we expect angry eyes to have an angry mouth. But watch what happens if I put the same mouth on that we've been doing. Half of a smile on this side, half of a smile on that side. What do we get? You get someone who's being really thinking nasty thoughts, right? The person who is, is going to rule the universe. It's an evil uh, face. So we put on the teeth and then we do the fur again. And you can mess around a lot with the fur. Um, I'm going to try and do a nice fat cheek on this guy and we'll see if I can do it this side as well. And then ears. I've been using little curves for ears, but you can also just do a bunch of zigzag lines for one ear, for the other ear, and a bunch of fur in between. So what you can do now, if you enjoy drawing, or if you have uh, young children in your, your family and you want to show them some neat stuff, you can take these three drawings that we've just done and you can play with them. And the way you play with them is, instead of doing a smile, do some other mouth, uh, do a frown mouth, do one straight across, do a small little mouth, do a little circle for a mouth, like open. Move the pupils around. And every time you move something, the pupils and the mouth, you create a new expression, a new feeling. And if you want to illustrate books, that's one of the things you really have to do. You have to be able to create all sorts of different expressions. If Catherine writes that a, a character is happy or sad or frightened or mean or worried, then the illustrator has to be able to create those faces. This is how we do it, just by plan. Any questions? <laughs> I'll pass it back to Catherine. Or do you, you have more to do, Catherine? I don't, I don't really have more to do unless people want to see my squirrel videos, but no. Um, okay. No, uh, but that's cool. I loved making that. I'm so glad oh, everybody nice. did that. that Thank fun. you for the lesson. That's You're great. Welcome. And I'm so impressed by, uh, by your art, which you do by hand, because a lot of people uh, these days do digital. Like if you mess something up, like that's on the page. You can't just, you know, call up the old file. That's very cool. Very oh, cool. actually, I use acrylic paint and acrylics are, they're plastic. 
and their artist quality, the colors you see now will still be there 300 years from now. Um, and with acrylics, I can actually paint out anything I want and then paint in something new. So when um, Sharon Fitzhenry called me up and said she wasn't happy with the, the character, what I did was I took that character and I painted out the face uh, just with white paint. And then I, uh, with the help of uh, uh, my niece, Chrissy and her daughter, Maya, uh, we, she took the photographs, sent them to me. I tried to work in a new face. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, with acrylics, you can do that. It's, they're really kind of neat. I love them. First time I used acrylics, it was like using bubble gum on the end of a brush. I hated them. Uh, but after when I learned what they could do, then, yeah, they can do anything, oils or watercolors or anything can do. Very cool. And uh, I was actually surprised to see the size of your originals. Like they're, they're quite small. It must be really difficult to do detailed work on such a small, I mean, uh, I know I, I'm not an artist, so it's all difficult, but, uh, yes. but yeah, it looks tough. It I'm is, glad you're doing uh, that part. I have a very large um, loop uh, magnifier okay. with a on it. <laughs> So uh, I use that a lot uh, because yeah, there is a lot of detail. And um, my uh, eye doctor told me I've, I've got cataracts, so I've got <laughs> new lenses coming in in, um, in January. So I'll probably see more detail then. <laughs> than right Excellent. And for uh, my niece, her skin is much lighter than this, her hair is blonde. So this would be a little bit of a shock, I think, uh, for them. <laughs> All right. But that's, that's part of the fun. Yeah, cool. Uh, any questions that anyone have for uh, Catherine or myself? You can either put them in the chat or hold up or, ju or just talk, start speaking. So we'll ask everyone. Oh, there you are. Call that. Holly? Uh, so uh, how did you two work together on the book? Um, well, it was actually a really a, a bit of a treat because typically with a picture book, the text is finalized first and then the editor gives that to the artist and tries to keep the writer away because we want to tell the artist how to do their work, right? And so they try not to, to, to let us talk to them. But with this one... Um, my original story was actually almost twice as long as what's in the book. And, and before the editing was done, I got uh, a message from Sean saying he'd worked out some sketches for the story. And so I was able to cut the word count in half because I had the benefit of seeing his rough sketches. So he knew the story. So, I mean, he complimented me to say, I didn't, I'm not too wordy, but that's because I was too wordy originally, but then I cut and so and to leave room for the illustrations, but it was so much easier to do that because I had his sketches. So I could just say she had long conversations with Blue Jays and he already understood that she was, you know, um, getting the Blue Jays to be little uh, mercenaries <laughs> in the kidnapping plot. Um, so, so it wasn't like sitting down collaborating side by side, but it was more back and forth certainly than, than is typical with uh, a picture book. Um, yeah, usually I have always envied, um, you know, people who work in film or music or things where people actually collaborate to make something creative. That rarely happens in writing, even with, even with picture books where there's a writer and illustrator are working together you're usually working separately so it was a little bit more collaborative and it was certainly easier for me because of the way it went back and forth a bit and uh, Catherine I've told you this before and I'll tell everybody Catherine is absolutely wonderful to work with um, <laughs> some, see I'm not the snarky little sister I'm not <laughs> <laughs> some some authors you know they write the story and if the illustrator asks for you know, a change or a change of order or whatever, uh, 
they they don't want to change. Some are very very difficult, even for I know the the editors with the uh, working at the publishing house. Um, some authors are very difficult to to edit uh, because their words are golden, I guess. <laughs> Um, but Catherine was just just wonderful to work with. We sent things back and forth. And um, yeah, I, if any of you get a chance to work with Catherine, <laughs> do it. <laughs> <laughs> Same the other way. It was a real pleasure to work with you, Sean. Yeah, yeah. Squirrel, squirrel lovers are notoriously chill. I mean, we're easygoing people, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sean, how did you figure out uh, what points you wanted to illustrate when you're reading the story? How do you figure out which um, descriptive you, you want to put into the illustration? Uh, for me? Yeah. Um, well, it's when, when you write a story, and, and people are used to writing, so I use that as an example, but when you write something, usually uh, like Catherine will tell you, the first draft is not the thing that you see uh, ending up on, on the uh, bookshelves. And so for illustrating a story, it's the same thing. Uh, we look at, you know, what, whatever the author's words suggest and play with a lot of, a lot of different ideas. Uh, and a great many of them, you know, never make it into the book. Uh, I have you know, pages and pages of, of you know, illustrations, uh, just ideas, and I'll work in whatever sketchbook I happen to have near me at the time, and I'll just play and play and play, uh, and might come up with uh, all sorts of ideas that, that simply don't make it, but eventually, um, yeah, the, the ones that or that seem most fun, I guess, and the ones that help put uh, images to the to the words, uh, they're the ones we end up with. But uh, if you hired, uh, you know, five different illustrators, you'd end up with five different stories. Uh, just the way it goes. Again, with a movie, if you hire five different directors to do one script, you'll get completely different movies because. The director and I guess the the uh, illustrator. Uh, we have to select the time, the place, the location. Is it, you know, did it take place in 1850 or 1950 or you know today? Uh, is it a rural setting? Uh, you know, is it in England where squirrels are hated? <laughs> you know, um, so they're all little decisions we make, and I know. Uh, authors really fret about all of these things. Um, uh, and that's one reason why uh, the publisher tries to keep the author and the illustrator uh, apart. They don't want either one leaning over the other shoulder saying, do it this way, do it. You know, I, I, I want this character to look like my brother. Um, that, that kind of thing. I have to say, I was so impressed, Sean, when I saw your sketches that you actually drew like scientifically possible ways for them to get the girl up the tree. Like they use a wagon and then they use a pulley system. I mean, I just kind of had them. I, I didn't even know how to picture that, but I was so impressed with that. Yeah, so that was could be a true story. <laughs> it is. It is a true story. <laughs> uh, well, I have to show you this because the, the book ended up being a smaller size. And when they did reduce the size, if you look in the, this page in the book, you'll see that this character over here is, his head is lost. And I think Holly could explain why, but I, su I suspect that at the last minute, uh, you know, the, the printer or whatever said, uh, you know, we can make it this size a lot easier and make it go, or, you know, the scans will work better this way. And so little things like that do get cropped. Uh, and mm -hmm. there's one picture that never ended up in the book. Uh, we talked about that. I'll scoot back here and get it. <laughs> um, it's of, uh, I think Holly knows it. It's one of the girl. Mm 
Mm -hmm. uh, there was one image. Right. Get forward here. This was, I'm trying to get some light on it. So this was a reflection in a squirrel's eye of uh, the sister sort of dancing along. And um, when we ended up uh, working with the, the book designer at Fitzhenry, um, this didn't fit in that well with all of the, uh, the text where the text had to go. So we simply dropped it. And those things happen. Any other questions, suggestions? Well, what's next for the two of you? Um, well, Catherine, you're already working on one. Have you told everybody that or? Yes, I'm working on a teen novel. Um, I have a Canada Council grant, so I'm working on a teen novel every day. And um, it's a, a love story. So it's my first love story. And boy, that's really tapping into my memory. What was it like to be a teenager in love? Oh my God. But it's fun and it's in verse because um, that's just how it came out. So uh, as well as writing every day, I'm also studying poetry and trying to um, get these kids to write better. <laughs> It's in two voices, so it's it's fun. I, I love it. Uh, yeah. So that's what I'm working on. Right now, I'm just, I'm drawing every day and I'm enjoying life. Uh, I have to get new lenses put in my eyes and right now it's January. So I'm, I'm not working on anything greatly detailed. What I am doing is catching up on uh, all the work uh, around the house. <laughs> that has been sitting around waiting for, waiting for me to work on it. So I'll be doing that for the next few months. I have a, uh, three, maybe four stories that I've been playing with over the, the last couple of years. And I have a novel that I've written that needs a real big rewrite. So I wanna work on that as well. So just, uh, it's playtime. Sounds like you're both busy. Catherine, we have a question for here here for you. Uh, it says, "Would love to uh, love to know what you found most challenging about writing a picture book. How it differs from a full length novel. They're not as easy as you might seem." Uh, yeah, they're 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 very challenging i i would not say i'm especially good at it actually it's not like my strong i would say i'm better at novels um picture books i'm actually you know i first write them almost as short stories that's more natural to me and then and then i sort of translate them into picture books like what what might be a picture book but the hardest thing i think is trying to come up with a a narrative arc like to make it a story instead of just a series of words and images to to tell a story and to leave a lot of room for the illustrations all of it all of it is hard and you'd think that writing you know a 300 page novel would be harder but it's just a different kind of hard um yeah they're not as easy some people are are just more natural um also, also imagining kids that age, like when I go into kindergarten classes, oh my God, they can't even tie their shoes. You forget how little, little kids are. And I tend to talk way above them, like as if they're 10 and really they're only five. And so that also putting things into a child's view, like the way that they see the world and the aspects of the world that they can understand and think about, that is also hard. It's all hard. For me, it's all hard. <laughs> And, uh, and Laurie uh, Weber asked that. She writes for teens and she writes in verse. Um, yeah, I should be talking to Laurie more <laughs> for tips. Um, and my sister Laurie, the two Laurie, my sister Laurie, who is here, is a poet as well. I should be getting tips from her. We've got two poet Laurie's. Well, and there's several illustrators and lots of writers on this call too. So, um, one of. Uh, one of, I overheard my daughter talking to one of her friends and they were in high school at the time. And my daughter asked her friend, you know, do you think you could write a picture book? And her friend said, it's a kid's book, duh. How hard can that be? <laughs> and um, if we go back 20 years, uh, you know, the, the typical 
picture book was 900, 950 words long. But over the last 20, 30 years, that 900 has dropped down to 600 or even less. And it's really difficult, as you said, getting the whole story uh, into that, that little space. And the added difficulty is uh, when you write a novel, if it's a YA novel, you know what your audience is. You can write an adult novel, that's fine. You can write a novel for kids in like grade five to eight, um, you know who you're dealing with. But when you write a picture book, you have two audiences. You have the, the young child who will like to go through the book, who wants to enjoy the story. And you have the older sibling or the babysitter or the parent or grandparent who has to read it to the child. And so you're, you're trying to please both of them. And if you write a story that the parents love and the kids hate, like, you know, brush your teeth or you'll lose them, um, then uh, the kids will hate it. Nobody will, you know, the book won't sell. And if you write one that the kids love and the parents hate, again, it's no good. Remember Calvin and Hobbes, the, car, the uh, comic strip? Uh, they did a series uh, where the father um, is reading bedtime stories to, to Calvin and Calvin, you know, the little boy and his uh, make-believe live tiger, Hobbes. And the father, there, there's one little strip where the father says, I'll read you any story you want, except, and Calvin says, I want, uh, I forget the guy's name. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Sylvia's calling me. What's it called? Hamster Huey. Ah, right, Hamster Huey. So that the pop or Calvin says, I want Hamster Huey and the gooey kablooies. And the father says, no, no, I hate that. I want Hamster Huey, Hamster Huey. So finally, the father says, fine, I'll read you Hamster Huey and the Louie Kablooies. And the last frame shows Calvin and Hobbes sitting up in bed. Their eyes are wide open in shock. And one of them says, wow, it really finished different that time. And the other one says, yeah. I wonder if the village people will ever find Hamster Huey's head. So that's, you know, you have to appeal to, to both audiences. It's tricky. Uh, well, sir. Uh, picture books are especially hard, I think, because they tend to get read and reread and certainly allowed over and over and so it's hard to write something that people would want to hear again <laughs> you know you've got it okay we want to hear again and of course there's pictures to make it you know there's more to look at so there's yeah but yeah there uh, valerie you said picture books are the hardest and yeah i agree they're really hard yeah, yeah. and frida i think you've said that too before yeah, i think it's a i think it's common knowledge picture books are tough my, my daughter, when she was about three years old, she had one book she fell in love with, and it was published by two different publishers under two different names. One was called Plain Noodles, and the other was called Baby Boat. Uh, she loved it, and the story was about a little boat full of babies, and this one four-year-old girl uh, washes up on the shore of a, a lighthouse, and the old lady in charge of the lighthouse hasn't looked after babies for you know decades but the little girl the four-year-old knows exactly what to do uh for the babies and so she shows the you know the the elderly woman um how to change their diapers and mix their their food and do all of these things uh, my daughter maggie absolutely loved it and we read that book every day at least once a day for close to a year. And I didn't get tired of it because there were things in there that I could enjoy as well as you know my three-year-old daughter who dreamed of all that power. Yeah, nice. 
So and picture books can be read when you're uh, you loved them as a kid, but you can still love them as an adult. You see the whole different side to them. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I think uh, one of the, a great thing about um, if you work with kids or you write or you work in libraries or teach or anything is you have picture books in your life forever. Like a lot of people never read picture books once their kids are grown or once they themselves are grown. And picture books, they can be as deep as a novel. They can be as, you know, say as much about life as, as uh, you know, something written for, for an older audience. And they're gorgeous, yeah. Do we have any more questions? I guess we should wrap it up then. <laughs> I want to thank everyone for uh, for tuning in. <laughs> um, relatives and friends and stuff. Ah, Chrissy, I see you. <laughs> and Maya, hi Maya. We just wanted to say hi, and it was so much fun to uh, help you out. And uh, it was a great project for us too. Oh, right. great. <laughs> if ever you need more photos or pictures, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> is the book available already? Yes, it store? is. In the stores oh. or online? Yes, yes. Uh, you can buy it in the stores or, or online. Well, thank you all so much. I'm just, I had a great time. I'm so glad you were here. I, it's very nice. It's uh, nerve wracking doing something like this because you think nobody's going to come and nobody cares that you had a book. And so it's great. It's great. Thank you so much. And thank you, John, for being such a wonderful partner in this. And thanks, Holly, for hosting. Happy holidays, everybody. <laughs> and everybody else. Thanks very much, Sean. Thanks very much, Catherine. And I'll uh, Put another thank you to uh, our, our independent bookstores, Perfect Books in Ottawa and Book Lore in Orangeville. Uh, they'd be happy to facilitate the sales if you want to buy the book, or I should say when you want to buy the book. Um, and uh, thanks for joining, everybody. Thank you. Have a good thank evening. You. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. It's so nice to see you all. Bye. 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 Hello. Thanks, nice. Catherine. That was great. Oh, thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Tildy. <laughs> thanks for coming, Peggy. Cool. Nice to see you. Hi, Anne. Can I come say goodbye? <laughs> Can I come say goodbye?